Well, good morning. Good morning. Lord, we just humble ourselves before you right now. We ask that you would minister to us, that you would melt us, mold us, and shape us, Lord. Turn us into people that you want us to be. Holy Spirit, we just give you free reign and free control. And we pray that each one of us would leave here touched and changed by you. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Uh, you know, uh, God never fails to surprise me in the things that he does and, and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. I didn't share this at the first service, but earlier this week, uh, I was called by a pastor, somebody I've had a relationship for a long time, and he said, hey, I've been, there's a lady at my church that we've been praying for for years, like three years, and she's got a lot of issues, a lot of stuff going on, and he said, just, just felt led that I'm supposed to invite you, and would you come in and, and minister with this woman, and we could set up a meeting. So this week we went and, and uh, went, went to, you know, Jesus sometimes went across the Sea of Galilee for one person, right? And I like to minister to lots of people in a group and, and get the most uh, amount of ministry for, for the time. But there's times where God has you minister to the individual. And so we went to this place and went to, at the request of this pastor, and went to pray for this lady. And the list of stuff, uh, literally, so when I'm, she's in her 40s, and she had a cane, and uh, this is how she walked. She needed a walker. She was cheating with the cane, but she'd put the cane in front of her, and she would just take little steps like this. And she was walking like this, and there was this, she had neuropathy, and there was, uh, it was actually uh, HIV. So a woman had HIV, it had been, it's just a long story, and all the stuff that goes with that, and all these diseases, all the stuff, because the immune system being down because of the HIV, all the stuff that went with it. And uh, I mean, she just was, and she had young, she has young children, young children. And, you know, again, a woman in her early 40s, young children, but she's had this disease. And it has just destroyed her body. And uh, we, we were able to minister to the woman for uh, hours. Literally, it took hours of speaking the word and getting her to a place where she could be receptive before we even tried to pray. And, you know, so just, just ministering to her in the word and, and telling her about that God is a healer and that he does love her. And, you know, just talking about how God forgives and just the different blocks that we see at different times of, for people's healing. Let me tell you this. When we got done praying with this woman, it was me and the pastor and stuff. We prayed. We got done praying with this woman. Uh, so she had really bad neuropathy to the point that she couldn't really feel her foot. And they had put in a, uh, what, a nerve stimulator to try and stop the pain. I mean, it was that bad. And they just removed it just a couple days ago, removed the nerve stimulator. And this woman was, like I said, you know, just hobbling around and barely moving. She couldn't stand without the cane. We got done praying, and this woman was walking around the room with no cane. And I said to her, I said, can you go faster? How fast can you go? And she, and she did a slow jog. This was a woman that was walking like this with a cane. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, she was walking like this with a cane, and now she's doing a slow jog. And she's crying, and she's saying, you know what? I've had this a migraine headache, and there's a reason why, because the, the whatever is in her uh, spinal fluid, and she said, I've had this migraine headache that's like a number 10, and they've got me on, you know, they had her fentanyl patches, I'm just maximum amounts of pain medicine, and she said, I do not, for the first time in three and a half years, I don't feel my head, she said, I can feel my leg, everything was working, I mean, God was just healing and healing and healing, but I think more importantly, even the physical stuff, he was healing her on the inside. Right? It, was, it was starting with the internal healing. And where we're going to go today, you'll see how this applies, but we have to make a choice, Christians. We have to make a decision to, to be in God's presence. It, we, know, we know that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. So you go to Walmart, God's there. And you, one person, this, this gal here, she goes to Walmart. And this gal here, she goes to the gas station. And God's both places, right? He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's at churches around the United States and around the world right now. As we're here worshiping and ministering today, he's all over, omnipresent. But there are those times where we are able to feel his manifest presence. And you know there's a difference. When you feel the manifest presence of God, when you really tap in and you really dwell and abide and get into his presence, there's nothing like it. It's, it's where sickness has to flee. Sickness can't be there in his presence. It's where uh, emotional things get healed. It's where God, and even if the presence, you know, you can be, I, I spent a year in the hospital, sick, and there were times where the pain was so overwhelming, the only way I could escape the pain, it wasn't the, 
It wasn't the the Dilaudid. It wasn't the morphine pump. It wasn't any of that. It was getting in God's presence. That's the only only relief I had at times, was just pressing in and getting in God's presence. But that's a choice. That's a decision. And unfortunately, we as Christians, a lot of times, just relegate that to Sunday morning. We relegate our, our God time, our God experience to Sunday morning, and just live like the world the rest of the week and just struggle and struggle and fight and get in these valleys and ups and downs when God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to stay in his presence. And when we do, everything changes. If you'd open your pew Bibles with me, please, uh, page 718 in the pew Bibles. Page 718 on the left page over there, on the left side, Psalm 91. Page 718 in the pew Bibles, Psalm 91. So as I've been praying about this message, about this weekend specifically, the Lord put this, uh, these verses on my heart. And we're going to start there. So Psalm 91, and we're going to just go verses 1, start with verses 1 through 6. Verse 1, whoever dwells, different versions say different things, dwell, abide, stay. Whoever dwells, abides, stays in the shelter of the Most High. Uh, I like the way King James, New King James actually says, whoever uh, dwells in the secret place, whoever stays in the secret place of the Most High will rest, another version, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This, this verse is key. This verse number one, this is key about what we're going to be talking about today. It's talking about us making the choice to dwell, stay, abide in God's presence. That's what it's talking about here. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare. And not just surely, other people too. (laughs) And from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, mighty wings, another version. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. So it's an if-then. Really, and it goes on, verse 9 actually does say if and then then. So it's an if-then. If we choose, as Christians, to dwell, abide, to stay in God's presence, if we do that, then, verse 2, he is a refuge. Then, verse 2, he is the one we can trust. Then, verse 3, he is the one who saves us from evil people and evil things like disease. Then he is the one who covers and protects us like a baby bird, verse 4. Then we don't have to fear danger, verse 5. And I know there's people that struggle with anxiety. There's all kinds of people that are on pain or on different medications for anxiety. Well, here, here's, the, here's the answer. We don't have to fear. In fact, the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love. And what that means is when we get a revelation for with when we get a revelation of God's perfect love for us, when you and I get a revelation of God's perfect love for us, it drives out fear because we realize, you know what, I've got a God who's the creator, maker, redeemer, savior, Lord of lords, king of kings, and he loves me so much that I don't have to fear. There's nothing I have to fear. So he tells us here, if we dwell, if we abide, this speaks of staying in his presence. And that's a daily choice. We get to make that, we get, you know what, you can make the choice, the decision to come out of his presence real easy. So if I get mad at my wife, get mad at my kids, start yelling, start freaking out, guess what, I just came out of God's presence. Get mad at somebody when you're driving that cuts you off, I just came out of God's presence. You know, get disturbed, angry, upset with somebody at work, I just came out of God's presence. Start thinking about some past hurt of some unforgiveness that I have for maybe a mom or a dad, maybe it's somebody that's dead 10 years We start dwelling on unforgiveness, we come out of God's presence. We have to make a choice. We have to make a decision to stay in his presence. And it doesn't happen on accident. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens by making the choice. It speaks of David in the uh, New Testament. Peter actually talks about in Acts. And he said that David practiced the presence of the Lord. What's that look like? What does it look like to practice the presence of the Lord? Let's say somebody here, and you know what, just just by national averages, 55 to 60 percent of men who go to church regularly struggle with pornography use. These are people in church. 
That's what the national average is. 55 to 60% of people, men and women, men and women, struggle with pornography use. And these are people, regular church attenders. So what does it mean to practice the presence of the Lord? I personally struggled with pornography for, for many years, right? So to struggle with an addiction. I also smoked pot for 20 years, every single day for 20 years. I snorted coke, I drank whiskey, I partied like a wild man, Jaeger bombs, you name it. And I lived that way for 20 years. Lived that way for 20 years. To practice the presence of the Lord means if somebody is going to go on the computer, hide away on their smartphone, sneak in the bathroom, whatever they're going to do, and look at pornography, all of a sudden the Christian, because there's Christians doing it, the Christian all of a sudden realizes, guess what? God's here in the bathroom with me. God's in the study with me. God's here at my, he's sitting right here with me. Maybe I shouldn't click on this. Uh, God's right here with me. Maybe I shouldn't be flirting with this girl at work or this guy at work when they're married and I'm married. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be backstabbing the pastor or this person or that person or this person that drives me crazy at church. Maybe I shouldn't be gossiping about this person or that person because you know what? Jesus is right here with me. And he's listening to every word. Now, we're not talking about a God who's right there as like the judge to beat us over the head and say, knock it off. We're talking about a God who loves us so much that's right there. He's like, oh, no, no, no. I've got so much better for you in your life than this. Don't do this. You know what? Just don't do this. Don't say that. Don't worry about this. Don't fret about that. Don't let that, what that person said to you when you were a kid that said you were overweight, don't let those words affect you right now and you're 50 years old. Or don't let what your mom and dad said to you when you were a kid and now you're 60 and you're still fighting with No, no, no. I want to I heal that. Amen. I want to fix that. If we choose to stay in God's presence, he will do that for us. He will heal the junk and the garbage so that the other stuff has no appeal. And when we are really practicing the presence of the Lord like David did, it's easy to say no to stuff because you're thinking, you know what? He is right here watching in a good way, not in a bad way. He's right here loving on me, and that gives me the strength so that I can say no. That gives me the strength to make the right choice, to make the right decision, to say the right thing to the person, to forgive the person who's wronged us, right? That's practicing the presence of the Lord. If we do that, then all these promises, he's our refuge, he's our fortress, the one we trust, the one who saves us, right? Now, let me ask this. It says we don't have to fear danger, verse 5. But is, does it promise that he removes the danger? Does it say that anywhere in there? No. God doesn't say that he's, he'll remove the danger from our lives. Sometimes people like to write down and, and take notes on uh, sermons or messages. If you're a person that does that, I would say today, you know, three things, three points. Three statements that you might want to take with you so that you can think about, ponder, meditate on throughout the week. This would be statement number one, point number one. True safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Just think about that for a second. True safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den. There were hungry lions in this cave with him. Was it a dangerous situation? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Did God remove the danger? No, it was there. But did God protect him? Yes. See, true safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego from the book of Daniel, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace is so hot that the guys that throw them into the furnace die from being exposed to that heat. Just get into the mouth. They get thrown inside. Did they get saved? Yes, because the presence of God. They were practicing the presence of the Lord. It says that Jesus incarnate was in there with them. With them. The fourth, the fourth man in the fiery furnace, right? True safety is not found in the absence of danger by the presence of God. Um, there's a man I know that runs a uh, large Bible college in Africa. And uh, it's a long story, but he, he was a young man, and God called him to go to Africa and start him and his family to start this college his mom and dad are you know older this guy's like 20 years old when god puts this call in his life to start this bible college they're there they're looking for land to buy to do some stuff god has called them they're over there and in uh it, this happens to be in actually ghana africa i've ministered at his bible college and you know the are let's the roads are dangerous we've see, every time we go on mission trips whether it's to honduras or you know africa or different places we always see accidents that, that there's fatalities if you're there a week, you're going to see somebody dead on the road. It just, we just, we see it. There's, you know, there's no driving tests. You got a car, you can drive it, right? There's no, a lot of times there's no speed limits. There's no dotted lines or, 
or lines to pass, and they'll pass. They pass going up the hills, around the corners. That's usually where the accidents happen. It's usually head-on accidents. We see it over and over and over. Um, so he's there. They're, they're, you know, he's, now at this point, he's in his mid-20s. They're doing this, this ministry, and they're, in a, they're walking down the side of the road. A lot of times they're walking here, walking there. They're in the village. And this speeding car comes along like at 90 miles an hour, and everybody runs to one side of the road, and he ended up on the other side of the road, and the speeding car is going to hit him. Went off the road to hit him. He's going to hit him. Obviously, the devil sent, put a demon in somebody, and this, they're just going to kill him. His family and him tell this testimony. Something invisible picked him up off the ground. The speeding car goes underneath him, and then it sets him back down. His guardian angels, obviously, just said, oh, no, devil, you're not going to stop this ministry. Lifted him up. The speeding car goes right underneath him and sets him back down. And there was a lot of people. It wasn't just his mom and dad. There were many people that saw and attested to it. What it what ended up happening was it made such a testimony in that area, in that village, that people said the hand of God is upon this man. There's divine protection upon him. We saw what happened. God protected him. Right? So what the devil means for bad, God turns for Good, it's Romans 8, 28 in action. We know that in all things, God works the good of those love. And that's the things that, you know, sometimes we make mistakes and do bad things. God says, you invite me into it, I could turn that for good. Sometimes people do bad things to us that we didn't have any, you know, just something bad happens to us. God says, invite me in that situation. I promise I'll make good come out of it. True safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. We do a Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Resurrection Sunday every year in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And a couple years ago, I don't remember, it was two, three years ago, whatever, we were, you know, we, we come back to the hotel after a Good Friday service, and it had been a, you know, a later service, went late, and I can't, a lot of times after I'm done preaching and went to night service, I'm so wound up tight, I can't go to sleep. And that, that service, that weekend, for whatever reason, the girls stayed home, the, the, my two daughters stayed home, so it was me and my wife, Lori, and our two twins, Caleb and Jacob. And so the twins are in one bed and me and Lori in another bed. Lori falls asleep. I turn on the TV and I'm watching like Pickers, right? So I'm watching Pickers and me and the boys are watching it. And it's like 1130, quarter to 12 on Good Friday night. And all of a sudden I hear somebody jingling the, the door at the, the hotel. And I'm thinking, well, somebody's, they picked the wrong room. They're trying to get in and, and it isn't working. I'm not, we're just kind of, I'm just kind of, I sit up in bed. I kind of look. Next thing, they start kicking the door hard. They're kicking the door so hard, literally stuff, the extra pillows and the blankets that were in the closet right next to the door fell out of the closet because they're kicking the door so hard. They start to bend the door frame. The lock starts bending. The, the, the slider, the bolt is bending. I run. I'm just wearing my boxers. I run. I get up against the door with my forearms, and I plant my feet trying to hold the door as they're kicking it, and then I'm watching the thing bending. And I start screaming and I start declaring because it says uh, in Mark chapter 11, Jesus makes a statement. He says, you'll have whatever you say. So that means our, it goes back to what Solomon said in Proverbs. The power of life and death is in the tongue, right? So we speak life. So I start declaring and I say, you're not coming in here. Not today. It's not happening. You're not coming in here. You are not coming in here. And I'm yelling at the people that are trying to kick the door in. And they keep kicking. And I keep saying, you're not going to come in here. And I can hear my boys behind me saying, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, they're not coming in. In the name of Jesus, go away. And I'm holding the door. Well, finally, it bent. I mean, the, 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 the bolt is in a U. The metal frame is bent. And they finally get up, give up and run away. We call 911. The police come. And the police show up there. And we find out that this happens at this particular hotel about once a month. And we find out that the, the police are like, hey, just a little clue for you. When you go to a hotel in the city, man, never go next. If they try to give you a room, listen, if they try to give you a room next to the exit, don't take it. I'm like, why? He said, because it's always the room next to the exit. I said, why? He said, because they've got a, a routine. This is what they'll do. They sit outside by a, a remote exit, not by the main entrance, a remote exit where you got to use your card or whatever to get in. They stand up there smoking a cigarette, whatever, pretending. They wait till somebody comes in legitimately, opens it, and then they follow in behind, they throw their cigarette down, follow in behind, that person goes somewhere else, they go in the, in the stairwell to, now they're at a, you know, let's say they go second floor, third floor, whatever, and they go to a room right next to the exit, and they look for a room that's got a light on, a TV going, where they know people are in it, they kick them in with, at gunpoint usually, rob them, take their money, run back down, and guess what? There's a car now sitting outside waiting to take them away. It's never on camera, and they never get busted. 
And they do it over and over and over and over. And the, the cop said, you did, don't take a room next to an exit. So we no longer take a room next to an exit. But here's the thing. True safety is not found in the absence of danger but the presence of God. What were we doing? We were declaring. We were praying. We're, I'll guarantee there must have been an angel holding that door. Right? It was an, I, I might have had my arms against it, but I'm sure there must have been an angel there. And I might have been speaking and saying, you're not coming in here. But God was the one who was making sure that it wasn't going to happen. Amen? Amen? True safety is not found in the absence of danger but the presence of God. So the question becomes, how important is God's presence? How important is God's presence in our life? It is absolutely necessary for the, for the Christian to stay. If you're going to have a victorious life, then you are going to have to stay in God's presence. The Christian that comes out of God's presence is the Christian that has a lot of problems. Jesus said, and we're going to get to this, in this world you have trouble, you're going to have problems. But it's when we stay in his presence that we're protected, guarded, and, and guided through. You know, it's always awesome when you hear the testimony, Jesus calms the storm in the person's life. And everybody goes hallelujah, and the person gets healed, and everybody goes hallelujah. And the person gets off the dead, deathbed, and everybody goes hallelujah. But it's just as true that when the person doesn't get healed, and the storm stays, that Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm not going to go away, and I'm here in the middle of the storm. Right? I'm here in the middle of the storm. And in order for that, for us to have that peace in the middle of the storm, means we have to stay in God's presence. You know, verse 5 and 6, and it talks about in verse, uh, again, page 718, Psalm 91, verse 5 and 6. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Different versions talks about disease. Pestilence, disease, plague, different. It's, it's talking about sickness, it's talking about evil people, and it's talking about evil things, and then ends up with this plague and disease that talks about things that attack our health, right? Things that attack our health. I'll guarantee in a group this big, there are people in this room that are having some kind of health issue. Lots of people in this room having some kind of health issue. Maybe it's a bad back, maybe it's a cancer report, maybe it's a, a messed up ear. It doesn't, I mean, you know, it could be a million things, right? There's a lot of things. But listen to this. Here's point number two. If you're writing something down, point number one, true safety is not found in the absence of danger but the presence of God. Point number two, true, think about this. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness but in the presence of God. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness but in the presence of God. A couple of weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago to be exact, I came down with what I thought was like flu-like symptoms. I never get the flu. You know, some people get the flu all the time. You know what? Somebody says this. Every year when the flu goes around, I always get it. If that person says that, guess what's going to happen? They're going to get it because they're speaking it, they're declaring it, and they don't even realize their words have power. So that's a little rabbit trail, but just think about that. Power of life and death in the tongue. I never get the flu, and I'm speaking that, and I'm declaring that, and I haven't had it for like 20-plus years, right? So two and a half weeks ago, I come down with a splitting headache. It turns into a horrible, horrible uh, 103 fever with Tylenol. And I got this fever, I got this headache, and my chest starts hurting, and I'm sick for days. I'm type A, I can't hold still, and yet, and so I'm just like, I'm bedridden for days. Go to the doctor, I said, you know what, okay, it must be the flu. This has got to be, no wonder people are dying. This, this feels horrible. And I go, and they do the test, and they said, well, it's not, you know, A or B or one or two, whatever it is. They said, you don't have it, but there's other bugs that are flus that you could test for it and doesn't show up. So you've just got the flu. It's viral, it's gonna have to run its course. Flip back and forth between Tylenol and Advil, and you'll be good. So six days go by. The fever finally breaks. I'm finally able to move. It's Sunday morning, Super Bowl Sunday. I said, you know what? I, I wasn't preaching. Thank God. I said, I'm going to church. I'm going to church. So we went to church Sunday morning. Just getting out of bed and going to church wiped me out so bad that I came home and I slept the whole day. My family went to a relative's Super Bowl party. And about midnight that night, I woke up, and my chest hurt so bad, it felt like somebody was sitting on it. And I said to my wife, I waited a couple hours, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. I could get in God's presence, but it just, it wouldn't go away. I mean, I could feel it, it was there, God was removing it to where it made it bearable, but it was still there. And finally, I wake up, my wife, I said, you're going to have to take me to the emergency room. She takes me to the emergency room, they do a bunch of tests, I'm thinking there's something wrong with my lungs. And they do the test, and they're like, no, there's nothing wrong with your lungs. And the doctor says, you know, we got to do one more test on your heart. And I said, my heart's good. And he's like, you know what, we should just do this test. So he does a test, and he comes running in the room like 40 minutes later, and he says, oh, so we live between Stevens Point and Wisconsin Rapids. It's like four hours from here. And the doctor says, we've got an ambulance coming to take you to the heart center in Wausau. We got a, there's a heart 
specialist hospital in Wausau. We're taking the hospital. I said, why? And he's like, well, there's chemicals that are tracers for heart attack. And he said, you just had or are in the middle of having a major massive heart attack right now. That's why your heart hurts so bad. I said, no, you're crazy. He said, no, we know there's three different chemicals and and he's going through and he said, zero to 19 is normal. 300 is massive heart attack. He said, you're at 280 right now. He said, you just had or in the process of having a heart attack right now. I said, my wife can take me up there. I said, I'm good. I said, I've been feeling this way for like six days, dude. And he's like, no, 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 we're taking you by ambulance. So they take me up there and the doctor says, oh, the flu's got nothing to do with it. He said, you must have blockages. We're gonna have to go in and put some stints in. They do a CAT scan, they can't find any blockages. He said, but it's gotta be. So they do the heart catheterization operation. Go through, do the, go through the artery, you know, put me out with the anesthesia, the whole thing. And they're gonna go in there and put the stints in and the doctor gets in there and can't find any blockages, none. So he comes back. I wake up in the recovery room and the doctor says, this is just two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago it started. I'm in the op, uh, this is not like a week and a half ago, I'm in the hospital. And the doctor says, uh, well, here's the thing. He said, I got in there, there were no blockages. We didn't have to put any stints in. What we think is, he said, have you heard about the people dying from the flu? Have you been seeing that on TV with these healthy young people dying from flu? I said, yeah, we've got an orphanage we support in Honduras. We just had a 12 year old girl die after two days of having the flu. And I said, yeah, I know some other churches, at another church I speak at, 21-year-old girl dies, another church I speak at, 30-year-old person died. And he said, the reason why these people are dying from flu is because the flu virus sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, will attack an organ. It might attack the heart, it might attack the lungs, it might attack kidneys. When it does, the virus has to run its course, and they can try and fight it, and sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. But he said, that's what happened. He said, the flu virus, attacked your heart and caused you to have a heart attack. He said, but here's a strange thing. He said, when we got in there, we should have seen, based on the numbers, we should have seen damage in your heart. He said, but there wasn't any damage in your heart. He said, that's what really confuses me. You know what that is? That's the supernatural part because the very first day I started hurting, we've got a group of a thousand people on a list for our ministry. And I sent out this, I sent out this, uh, prayer request and to the cert- to some of them. And I said, you know what? I'm sick, there's something going on, please pray for me. So God supernaturally protected my heart. Even though I have this heart attack, he says, you know, you got a little bit of leaky valve. I said, maybe that was from 20 years of cocaine use. He said, it could be, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. He said, I don't know. He said, but you just got a little bit of leaky valves. He said, but there's no scarring. So I'm like, oh, what are you guys gonna do? So then they, they're doing some more stuff and when it, they keep me in the hospital and they this is just, again, like a week and a half ago now. So they got me in the hospital and they said, we're gonna give you this medicine. So they gave me this medicine, my hands turned numb, my feet turned numb, I felt really dizzy and sick. And I said, what is this medicine you just put in the IV? And he said, well, it's medicine for congestive heart failure. I'm like, what? What do you mean heart failure medicine? He said, yeah, we're gonna put you on this heart failure medicine. I said, how long? He said, two to three months, maybe the rest of your life. I said, why? He said, because you just had a massive heart attack. And he said, we're going to protect your heart by slowing it down. It's a beta blocker. And he's going through all this stuff. And I said, is is that what's making my hands and my feet numb? He said, yep. And I said, is that what make me feel weak? He he goes, yeah. He said, you'll get used to it. (laughs) I took my IV out. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you want to see him get mad? I took my IV out. I said, I'm not getting used to it. And you're not giving any more of that junk. No, no. And then they brought in a pill and they said, take it. I said, I threw it in the garbage. I said, I'm not taking it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling anybody here, don't take your medicine because God gives doctors wisdom, gives people wisdom to make medicines, and he does lots of miracles through medicine and all that. But you know what? If you get a rhema word from the Lord not to do something, you better not do it. And I heard the whole voice of the Lord say, don't take that. So I said, no. And then I said, you know what? At 1130, I'm leaving today. I've got a radio inver- I said, I'm leaving. So I took my stuff. I pulled well, that one. I took the one out of this arm. I changed my clothes. I called my wife. I said, come pick me up. And they're like, what do you, th- what do you think you're doing? I said, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave. And we're like, well, with a- before you leave, this other doctor has to come in and talk to you. And I said, well, if she's not here by 1130, I don't care. I'm leaving. And they said, here's the prescription that you need to take for these pills. I said, I'm not taking it. I'm not taking the pills. And you know what? Here we are a week and a half later. I feel like a million bucks. I do. God has, God has done what he's doing, right? See, it's, and even in the middle of that, there was times where I was really hurt in the hospital. I've had kidney stones at different times or just intense, crazy pain. If you practice the presence of the Lord and just, just press into him and press into him, it becomes tolerable. In fact, even in the midst of the pain, somehow you can get to a peaceful, joyful place. 
That's peace that doesn't make sense. That's peace that surpasses understanding. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but the presence of God. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but the presence of God. There was a gentleman at the the church that I attend, my pastor tells a story, there was a local Catholic family, didn't go to our church, but this this local Catholic family and their uh, brother was excommunicated out of the church, got divorced, whatever, he did some stuff, and so he gets lung cancer and he's dying, he's in the hospital, and so the family asked the local priest, can you come in and give him his last rites? And the priest says, no, I'm not going to give his last rites because he's, you know, he's excommunicated out of church. So they go through the phone book, find my pastor's number for our church, call him up and say, hey, will you come give our pastor, or give pastor so-and-so, will you come give our brother last rites? So he's like, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know you guys, but I'll come in there and pray for your brother. So he shows up to the hospital and he says to the guy, he says, hey, what's going on? And he says, well, they're giving me like a week to live couple days to a week to live, I, the cancer spread, and what I said, I'm a lifelong smoker, you know, I smoke three packs a day, blah, 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 and he said, it's killed me, and, so, and he's like, uh, he says, well, what do you want me to pray? And, he's, and the brother says, pray that God heals me. He said, I don't want to die. He said, well, your family wants me to give you last rites. He said, I don't care what my family said, I want, I want to get healed. So my pastor's like, you, that's, I'm with you, let's pray that you get healed. So they pray, and God miraculously heals the guy, takes away the lung cancer in the... I mean, we're talking about no treatments. They weren't giving him treatment. The other guy on the hospice care, right? There's no treatments. Boom, God miraculously heals him, gives him new lungs. The guy feels like a million bucks. Guess who's in church next Sunday? Huh? This guy's in church, and his whole family's with him. Because they're, you know, they said we're Catholic, but they didn't go to... They were like the church that I grew up in. I grew up... Any, you know, somebody here might relate to this. My mom and dad were priesters. Priester religion. We only went to church on Christmas and Easter. And that's if somebody wasn't too drunk first, right? So that's when we went. And that's this kind of family. They said they're Catholic, but they're not going to church. So the guy, he comes to church for a couple weeks, and then he just kind of disappears. Then he shows up in a month, and pretty soon he's gone. And so like a year and a half later, my pastor runs into the gas station. He's like, hey, Joe, how's it going? What's going on? He's like, oh, man, awesome. He goes, I'm not coughing. He goes, I'm, you know, I'm smoking a couple packs a day. I don't cough. I can breathe it in. It feels good. He said, man, I'm doing great. He said, well, we haven't seen you at church at all. He said, yeah, I don't need to go to church to worship God. I'm good. I don't need to go to church to worship God. And the pastor said to him, man, I don't think God healed you so that you could just go back to the way you were. I think God healed you so that your life would change. He was showing you he's really showing he loves you. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Guess what? You know, a period of time goes by, the guy gets his cancer back. Years, two, three, two and a half, three years later, cancer comes back, kills him, right? True healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but in the presence of God. Think about it like this. All the miracles you read in the Bible, all the people that were, you know, blind eyes open, deaf ears open, paralyzed person gets up and walk, every one of those miracles came to naught because those people all died. Eight people in the Bible raised from the dead other than Jesus Now think about this one. Eight people in the Bible raised from dead other than Jesus. Every one of them died again. True healing, true healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but in the presence of God. Just for, just so I know, uh, hand raised, how many people here have never heard my testimony about the accident? Raise your hand, real high. Okay, so maybe a third. So, pastor asked if I would share the testimony because he said there was some new people here that didn't hear it a couple from years a couple years ago so 2006 I traveled around the state of Wisconsin I had a business I did on-site diesel repair based out of where we're at in Wisconsin Rapids Stevens Point so I traveled around I had a, a big truck big service truck with all my tools on it and I I just specialized in engine overhaul and runnability and that's what I did. And I'd go all over. And one day I might be on the roof of a hospital working on a diesel generator. The next day I might be in a gravel pit working on a piece of heavy equipment, you know, whatever. So I just diesel engines. So in 2006, I was working on a big Peterbilt logging truck. So I'm working on this big Peterbilt logging truck. It was a three-day job. It was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. At Thursday night came along. I'm working at this place about an hour. I was driving back and forth to this particular job site, an hour from my home. They had their own mechanic, but this, didn't, this guy didn't have the training or the tooling to do the repair that I did. And so I'm, I'm doing the repair, and he's helping me. It's because I charge a lot per hour. They'd usually have somebody help to make the job go quicker, right? So... The guys there helping me Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we get to the end of the job Thursday in order to test the repair, we start the engine, make sure it's no longer leaking coolant. So I said to Leonard, that's the name of the mechanic I was working with, jump up side, start it. And he, and he says to me, hey, he says, there's one more thing I'd like you to look at. He said, I've got this dirty spot. It's a caterpillar. 
big yellow Caterpillar engine. The hood is open, it's a conventional, long nose. And he said, I got this big dirty spot on the engine. And he said, I wipe it off and it comes back within a couple weeks. He said, it's seeping oil out of somewhere. He said, but I just can't tell. He said, can you diagnose it? Can you figure it out? Maybe come back, order the parts, come back. Or he said, maybe it'll be something simple and you can just tell me what to do. I'll do it myself. I said, sure. I, in, immediately in my mind, because of the series engine, there's a couple of inherent problems they have. Oil leaks, I'm thinking it's gonna be this or that, a, a gasket or a, a crack housing. So I get on a creeper, a little thing that mechanics use to go underneath vehicles. If there's anybody here today that's never looked underneath a big semi truck, picture the chrome bumper in the front, the front bumper, right? Big chrome bumper. And there's just that little bit of space between the bottom of the bumper and the road, or you know, whatever the truck's sitting on, cement in this case, in this garage. And just enough for me to get on the creeper and go underneath. And if you look underneath these big trucks, the lowest thing to the ground is the front axle. The reason why is their dropped axle. What that means is this. You got two wheels, the front two wheels that turn with the steering wheel, the axle connects on both sides, it drops down, it goes from the left to the right. And so I go underneath the axle, he had removed the passenger side wheel, I go underneath the axle, I'm laying underneath it on the creeper, and he had jacked it up with a jack but not used any safety equipment. No jack stands, no blocks. So I go underneath the truck, he gets inside the truck, the jack slips out, and this 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight comes down like a blunt guillotine right across the midsection of my body, between my bottom of my ribs and top of my pelvic right here, and crushes me flat like a blunt guillotine. I was literally, my body, I'm not exaggerating, I was one inch thick. My body was one inch thick here, I was two inches thick here, thinner than my spine, L4, L5 vertebrae, which is straight through from my belly button, were broken. Five places, major arteries were severed, all my small intestines, spleen, pancreas, everything that's in there crushed. So the guy jacks the truck up off of me. When he did, because of the five arteries being severed, I bled out. So I bled to death at the scene of the accident. He had called 911. The first two volunteer fire department, because it's in the middle of nowhere, right? The first two fire department guys are there. I've, I'm now out from underneath the truck somewhat. I bleed out, my heart stops. No more heartbeat, no more pulse. It's a pretty good indication that you are. At that point, my spirit left my body and I went up into the roof of the garage. Typical near death or out of body experience that people talk about. So I'm up above, let me say this, perfect peace. Words can't describe how good I felt. I felt amazing. 3% of the world's population at this time, right now, has had an out of death or near, near death experience and gets resuscitated. Uh, defibrillator, CPR, some kind of medical attention to get them resuscitated. Their spirit leaves their body, they come back in. 3%. 3%. If you do the math in the world, it's like 8 to 10 million people have had an out of body or near death experience when their heart stops and their spirit leaves their body. That means right here in the United States, that means in this room, I don't know, let's say if there was 300 people, that would be 369. There should be approximately nine of us in here. Other than me, maybe another eight, nine. We've, sometimes I take the time and have people raise their hand. We count it out. It's always really, really close. Anyway, near-death autobot experience. I'm up here in perfect peace, watching on the scene of the accident. Two huge angels, one on each side of my body. When the truck fell on me, I called out and said, Lord Jesus, help me. I remember saying it twice, just in case he didn't hear me the first time. Lord Jesus, help me. Right? I'm crushed in half here. This is bad. 911 prayer. Lord Jesus, help me. I die. My spirit leaves. I'm looking down on each side of my body, a huge angel, about eight feet tall. The reason why I know they're approximately eight feet tall, the guy that I was working with, Leonard, is six feet tall, approximately, and their head, the angel's head's stuck up a couple feet taller than his head. So based off of Leonard, I know they're about eight feet tall. Big, broad shoulders, white, shining robes. The Bible mentions angels about 290 sometimes. Sometimes they have wings, sometimes they don't. These angels didn't have wings. Big men in white shining robes, had their hands in the middle of my body. I'm watching from above. A two-month-old baby Christian comes to the scene of the accident, one of the last two people to show up. They're not doing anything with me. They're not going to do CPR. I've got a massive chest injury. No point in doing a defibrillator. They know I've bled out. So they're just, there's nothing they can do. I've been dead minutes. She shows up to the scene of the accident, and she prayed me back to life. Mark 11, Jesus said, speak to the mountain, back to our words. Her words over me were, I watched her, listened. She said, what's his name? They said, Bruce Veneta, the guy I was working with. He goes, Bruce Veneta. She starts going, Bruce Veneta, come back. Open your eyes right now. She yelled. She got louder, louder. My spirit came back. She was praying inside her head. And her step of faith, speaking it, speaking to the mountain was saying, come back, open your eyes. My spirit came back in my body. It hurt so bad I couldn't stand it. I'm like, no way, I don't want this. My spirit left. As soon as I, as soon as I made the decision, I didn't want it. Because I, I went from feeling amazing to back into a body that's been crushed. 
I'm like, no. And I left, and then a tunnel opened up. People talk about a tunnel with light on the end of it. There was a tunnel going up out of the roof of the garage. I got in the tunnel, started going towards the light. I know heaven was on the end of the tunnel. The closer I got, the better it felt. I was having the best day ever. And I'm going away, and I could hear her back there somewhere behind me yelling, Bruce Vanetta, you come back. You come back. I stopped in the tunnel, got sucked backwards out of the tunnel, back through the roof of the garage, back in, seems like through the head on top of my head, into my body, open my eyes. Here she is. I'm looking at her face to face. And at that point, God spoke to me. I didn't see him, but I know that I know that I know it was God. And he simply said this. If you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. I wish there would have been more, but there wasn't. Interestingly, he didn't sound rattled. Didn't sound nervous. Didn't sound scared. He was very, very calm. If you want to live, you're going to have to fight. It's going to be a hard fight. It took me about two seconds to think about it go, forget this. This hurts way too bad. And when I made that choice, see, he was giving me a choice. When I made that choice, my spirit left my body. I went into the roof, went into the tunnel that was there again, went towards the light. But Miss Persistent Baby Christian, two-month-old baby Christian, wasn't going to have any part of it. And she prayed me back to life the third time. And when my spirit came back into my body the third time, I'm looking at her right here. And she says to me, as soon as I come back, and she says, Mister, you're on the verge of life and death. What do you got to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? Do you have anything in this world to fight for? I had completely forgot I was married. I had completely forgot I had four kids. So the trauma, the pain, it never crossed my mind once until she said that. And I knew that I knew that I knew that God was speaking through her. I knew it was the Holy Spirit. The same voice that said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight. It's going to be a hard fight. Now speaks through her and says, what do you have to fight for? And she's reminding me, what about your wife? What about your kids? I couldn't fight for myself, but as the responsibility of being a, a father, the responsibility of being a husband, I could stay for them. Not because I wanted to, but because I, like, like they need me. I have to do this responsibility. So she said, don't close your eyes. I didn't. I ended up spending the next year in the hospital. Five major operations over the period of that year. I'd get out for a couple weeks, go back in for a month, two months, get out for a couple days, go back in, in and out, in and out, that whole next year. And they, like I said, doctors are amazing. They did operations that, in fact, one of the operations, two of the operations they did, they'd never done on anybody before. I mean, it was total experimental, guinea pig type stuff. And so uh, God did a lot of miracles. He did a lot of healing. They removed almost all my intestines. Adults have 18 to 20 some feet of intestine. 18 to 20 some feet of intestine, and I ended up with about this much. Not enough to live on, so I'm dying in the hospital. I lose 60 some pounds. God sends a guy from across the United States, woke him up two mornings in a row. He prayed for me in the hospital, bought his own ticket for $957, prayed for me, and God did a creative miracle and gave me back half my intestines. Nine to 11 feet of intestine came out of nowhere. Creative miracle, totally doctor documented. People say God doesn't do creative miracles, baloney, we've seen it. We've seen it over and over. We've seen pieces come back, right? My intestines. History Channel tried to disprove it. History Channel International did a series called Miracles Decoded. They went around the world, 24 miracles around the world. It was the only one out of 24 that they couldn't disprove. In fact, just this January, they'd done this, this series a couple years ago. Just this January, they redid my story and did a whole hour special on my story alone from that series. And all, I mean, they got all the doctors. They, they interviewed the doctors. They looked at the CAT scans, all the stuff, and they say, it's a miracle. These are atheist people doing it that tried to disprove it. And they said, we can't. We can't disprove it. Medically, here it is. And they say, I'm the only person that's lived in the world with five major arteries severed. So those two things. So we've got a God who does miracles, right? But here's the thing. I'm going to die again someday. I was literally just like the people in the Bible prayed back from death. You're looking at somebody that was dead and was prayed back to life. But I'm going to die again. See, because true healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but in the presence of God. When we read Psalm 91, it starts out the beginning. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And then it goes to all these verses, right? It says, then he's a refuge. Then he's the one we can trust, the one who saves us, the one who covers and protects us, the one that makes us so we don't have to have danger. And then in verse 9, if you turn to verse 9 with me, this is what it says. It's an if-then statement again. Anytime God repeats something in the Bible, what is that telling us? Listen up. So he repeats verse 1 and verse 9. If you say the Lord is my refuge and make the most high your dwelling. Make the most high your dwelling. 
Speaking of staying in his presence, practicing the presence of the Lord, making the daily choices and decisions for that to happen. If you do that, then he goes through and he does the same promises that are found in verses through 1 through 8. He's saying, you know, then uh, he's, no harm is going to overtake you. No disaster is going to come your way. He's going to command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So what we see is this, God making a promise to you and me. If you and I make the choice, if you and I make the daily choice, Choices throughout our day, every single. It's not a once, once a week Sunday morning thing. This is our daily choices. If you and I make our daily choices to stay in God's presence, to practice His presence, He honors that. And you know what? He protects us. There is a hedge of protection. Jesus said something. John sixteen thirty three. He said, "In this world, you'll have trouble, tribulation." He didn't say maybe. He didn't say might. He made a statement. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation. When you look that word up in the Greek, it talks about a grape going through a wine press and getting completely crushed. That's what the tribulation. Pressure on the inside and the outside. Guaranteed, there's people in this room, you've gone through situations in your life that crushed you. Crushed you emotionally. Like me, maybe crushed physically. Crushed you financially. Lost all your money. Crushed you spiritually. Crushed you in a relationship. You went through a horrible divorce. Have a prodigal son or daughter. A parent that is just a broken relationship with. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to go through things that are going to crush you. But take heart, I've overcome the world. That's the good news. He says, this stuff is going to happen. But stay in my presence, and we're going to get through this. I'm not going to leave you. If we get out of God's presence, it's not because he leaves us. It's because we leave him. If we're an orphan from God, it's not because he's decided to be fatherless to us. It's because we've decided to pull away from him. Think about that. If you don't feel God's presence in your life, it's not because he's not there reaching out to you. It's the FM antenna that's transmitting constantly, right? Think about it like this. The FM, FM antenna, the radio antenna, is transmitting constantly. But unless you've got the receiver tuned in, what do you get? Static. Right? You get static. You and I are the receiver. We are the ones that tune or in. If you're not hearing God's voice, if, if you're not feeling his presence, if you're not tuned in him, it's not because he's not transmitting. It's not because he's not sending out his love. It's because we're not tuned into it. And old school people, come on, when you tuned it in just right, what did you get? A little red light. Come on. Stereo, come on, right? You tuned it in. I'm talking old school, right? You tuned it in. The little red light came on. You got stereo. It was perfect. God wants us to be listening stereo to him. And it's there. He's transmitting, but it's our choice if we're going to be tuned in. It's our choice if we're going to be practicing the presence of the Lord or not. God wants you and I to stay in his presence. He doesn't want us to fake it. There's times where I meet somebody and they, I say, hey, how's it going? You know, I'll meet them at a church. Like today, people I'll meet. And they, and they go, hey, blessed and highly favored of the Lord. <laughs> and you go, you know, okay, that's cool. You're speaking positive. But you know what, dude? That was so fake, it reeked. <laughs> because pastor told me about your wife just left you or this or that or whatever, you know. We got to be real, people. We have got to be real. And when we're not real with each other and we're not real with other people, people can see it 10 miles away. They can feel it and it stinks. Amen. And they're like, you know what? I don't want any part of that. When we're honest about our garbage and our baggage and the things that hold us back and the things that hurt us, when we're honest about these things, it disarms other people. You go into men's meeting, I, you know, we do prison ministry. I do different places. Prison ministry, so I love prison ministry. You know why? First of all, you got a captive audience. I got no clock telling me that I'm 18 minutes over. I mean, there's nothing. There's like, no, I mean, you know what? They're there all day. They're there all week. It doesn't matter. You're there with them, right? Literally captive audience, for real. And, you know, you can be real with these guys because they all got junk and they know they're junk. Hey, they got a blue jumpsuit on. They're here for a reason. And the guys around, they all know this guy's here for rape. This guy's here for murder. You know, they all know they're junk. And they know everybody else is junk. And so you can be open with these guys and honest with these guys. And they're not false pretense, you know. One thing I dislike about churches and church people, I'll just be honest with you, because I didn't come out of church. I'm not a church guy. I'm a bar guy, okay, just so you know where I'm coming from. I didn't get raised in the church. I got raised in the bar, literally, as a little kid. I hung out in a lot of bars as a kid. So one thing I dislike about sometimes some church people and church places is they're fakey and they're hypocritical. And they come off like they don't stink and they're perfect. And it's like, you know what? Don't give me that. 
because I know better. We all got some stink in our life, right? But here's the thing. Jesus comes to set us free from the stink. Jesus comes to set us free, and he wants us to stay in his presence. And he's like, you know what? Yeah, you got some stink, but I love you, and I'll wash it off. I'll clean you up. Just stay with me. Stay here. So we get to make the choice. We're going to stay plugged in, or we're going to be faking. Let me just end with this. Here it is. Let me just end with this. I went to this church. I spoke at a church on a Saturday night, and the pastor from the next church on Sunday morning showed up at the Saturday night service. And when I prayed, there was a bunch of people that the power of God hit, and they knocked them out cold. And they were out, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, dead, you know, bodies all over, right? And the pastor, I saw the pastor from Sunday church. He was like, whoa. So Sunday morning, he's like, can you come into the office? So I go into the office. He's like, well, uh, you know, I was at the church service last night. I said, yeah. He's like, "Uh, I just, here's the thing. He said, "Uh, I don't, I don't want to see disruptive things in my church. He said, so at the end of service, he said, "Uh, I don't want you praying over anybody. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Whatever it takes. Your church, I'm under your authority in this place. I will honor that authority. Whatever you want, we'll do. Whatever you don't want, we won't do. He said, so, okay, he said, don't pray. He said, unless, he said, I'm open to the Spirit. He said, unless the Lord gives you a word or something, he said, then you can pray. But other than that, he said, I don't want you to invite people forward for altar time. I said, okay. What he didn't know was that morning, God had given me a dream. God gave me a dream that morning. Because God knew what was going to happen. In this dream, I'm in a backyard picnic with a family. And I'm listening to them, I'm talking, you know, they're talking, I'm listening to their interaction, and there just is something not right, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm listening to the things that the husband is saying to the wife, and saying to the kids, and I'm like, man, something is just not right, what is it? I just couldn't, all the, all the answers are right, all the stuff was right, and I'm talking to them, we're talking about God, and the answers are right, it was all real, but there's just something not right, and all of a sudden I become a fly, and I'm on this guy's shoulder right about here. And I'm looking up at his bottom of his chin, and I see there's a line. And it goes like this, and it goes back behind his ear, and I see it goes up in his hairline, and I can see there's sweat. He's sweating. I didn't notice it before, but he's sweating. He's nervous. And I see the line is a Hollywood-grade type best ever mask, like the most expensive best mask. I didn't even know the guy had a mask on until I was here, and I could see the line because it was so perfect. The mask was so perfect. And, I, and God showed me he's wearing a mask. He's wearing a mask in front of his wife. And the Lord woke me up and said, there are so many of my children who are wearing masks because they're afraid to let people know what's really inside. They're afraid to let people know the pain that they're struggling with. They're afraid to let people know the sin they're struggling with. They got the right answers. They can say the right things but it's a mask, and everything they say gets filtered through that mask. And God said, I just want my children to take the masks off. So that morning at the church when the pastor said, you know, don't pray for anybody unless you get a word, at the end I shared that vision, that dream that the Lord had given me. It wasn't a vision, it was a dream. And I said, you know what, if you're here today and you feel like you're wearing a mask and you can't be honest even with your completely 100% honest with your wife, with your kids, with your husband, with your pastor, with the people you go to church with, with the people you work with, if you're feeling like... People aren't going to accept your love for who you really are. God says, take the mask off. He'll liberate you because what is in the darkness is hidden and it's, there's power then. But when it comes into light, the power gets taken away. So I said, if that's you, come forward. The church emptied out. And the whole front, the whole front and people were crying, sobbing, screaming out to God. And people were getting slain in the spirit without anybody touching them. The power of God was hitting people, and they're dropping. And the whole church is wiped out. Like, the whole church is wiped out. And I just sat back down and handed the pastor the mic. (laughs) And shrugged my shoulders like, I don't know. Dude, I don't know what we're going to do now. So God has his way, right? God has his way with us. Now, let's just recap. This is it. You guys here? Are you good? You here with me? Let's just recap. Here it is. Think about this. True safety is not found in the absence of danger but in the presence of God. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but the presence of God. And you know what? Here's the last one. Here's the third one. Think about this. True peace. True peace is not found in the absence of chaos, strife, or grief. Because you know what? I know there's people in this room that are battling with their husband and wife. There's people in this room that are battling with their children. There's people in the room that are in grief. There's people in a room that have a life of chaos. 
True peace is not found in the absence of chaos, in the absence of strife, in the absence of grief, but in the presence of God. And when he gives us peace, it's peace that surpasses understanding. In other words, peace that doesn't even make sense. It's so big. It's so strong. It's so powerful. That's the kind of peace he's got for us. But you know what? For anybody to get the safety, for anybody to get the healing, for anybody to get the peace that we need, first thing we have to do, we have to be a son or daughter of God. If you're here today and you've never made a choice, if you're here today, you've never made a decision to make God your Lord and Savior. Now, here's the thing. There's a lot of people that say, I want God to be my Savior. Savior, the, the word Savior is used about 50 times in the Bible. And there's a lot of people who say, God, save me. Save my marriage. Save my health. Save my finances. But here's the other thing. The word Lord is used about 8,000 times in the Bible. A lot of people want God to be their Savior, but they don't want him to be their Lord. Because if he's your Lord, that means he's the boss. He calls the shots. He says, give money here. Don't give money there. Marry this person. Don't marry that person. That's what it means to be Lord. Like, he makes the decisions in our life. Like, yeah, but I want to marry her. No, she's not going to be good for you. Marry this one instead. Work here, don't work there, whatever. God wants to be our Lord, right? God wants to be our Lord. And once, see, Lord is who he is. Savior is what he does. If you make God your, if you make God your Lord, Savior part comes along as part and parcel of the package. If you just want him to be your Savior, mm, you're on thin ice, right? So if you're here today and you say, you know what? I'm ready to make the decision to make God my Lord. Could I have every head bowed and every eye closed, please? Because there is a difference between fire insurance. Oh, I just want him to be my savior so I don't go to hell. That's, that's, you know what? That's fire insurance. That's saying, okay, I want you to be a savior. And then there's a difference between saying, okay, be my Lord. Let's have relationship, intimacy, day in, day out. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're feeling a tug in your heart, if you've never made truly Jesus your Lord, and there's people that fill churches every Sunday that have not made Jesus their Lord, that just go through ritual and go through religion, if you've never done that, I know there's plenty of saved Christians in this room, but I know there's also people that have not made this choice, not made this decision. If you have not done that and you're feeling a tug in your heart, you want to have that safety, you want to have that peace, you want to have that healing, all that, all that Savior stuff that comes with the package, you want to be able to stay in his presence, then he has to be your Lord first. If, you, if you're open to that, if you want that, on the count of three, just raise your hand right where you're at. Every head bowed, every eye closed. One, two, three. Just raise them up high, not to me. This is, you're raising up to God. Keep them up there for 30 seconds. You're raising it to God, not to me. Keep them up. Just, I'm just doing a quick call. All right, so put them down. So the, the 30 people that raised your hand, here it is. If you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand and you're already a Christian, awesome. Just repeat after me. Everybody, if you're comfortable, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, right now this day, I make a choice, a decision to make you my Lord, to make you my Savior. I thank you that you died on the cross, but you rose again. You conquered sin, death, and the devil. I pray that from this day forward, that we would have intimacy. They would have daily relationship. Lord, help me to dwell, to abide daily in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give Jesus a clap?